gently close your eyes do deep breathing we'll chant om mans together synchronize the chanting of om with your exhalation breathe in सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्तु सहवीर्यम करवावहै तेजस्विनावदी तमस्तुमा वित्विशावहै ओम शांति 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 gently open your eyes we'll chant from verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3 arjuna uvacha arjuna uvacha जायसी चेत कर्मनस्ते जायसी चेत कर्मनस्ते मता बुद्धिर जनार्दन मता बुद्धिर जनार्दन तत्किम कर्मणि घोरे माम तत्किम कर्मणि घोरे माम नियोजयसी केशव ेणेव वाक्यन व्याणेव वाक्यन बुद्धि मोहयसी वे बुद्धि मोहयसी वे तदेक वद निश्चि तदेक वद निश्चि ये न श्रेयो हमुयाम ये न श्रेयो हमुयाम श्री भगवाच श्री भगवाच लोकेस्विधा निष्ठा लोकेस्विधा निष्ठा पुरा प्रोक्ता मया नघ पुरा प्रोक्ता मया नघ ज्ञान योगे न सांख्या नाम ज्ञान योगे न सांख्या नाम कर्म योगे न योगिना कर्म योगे न योगिना न कर्म नाम नारंभात् न कर्म नाम नारंभात् 
नैष्कर्म्यं पुरुषोष्णुते नैष्कर्म्यं पुरुषोष्णुते न च संयसना देव न च संयसना देव सिद्धिं समधि गच्छति सिद्धिं समधि गच्छति नहि कश्चित क्षणमपि नहि कश्चित क्षणमपि जातु तिष्ठत्य कर्म कृत जातु तिष्ठत्य कर्म कृत कार्यते ह्यवश कर्म कार्यते ह्यवश कर्म सर्व प्रकृति जैर गुणैः सर्व प्रकृति जैर गुणैः हरि ओम एंड अ वेरी गुड डे टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो वी आर इन वर्स नंबर थ्री उबेर इन इट इज सेड श्री भगवान उवाच द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड सेड so as i told you last week shri bhagavan uvacha from the yogic sense means the supreme infinite reality expressing itself speech is one form of expression in the scriptures many a times they use one word to symbolize an entire principle for example a master may say god cannot be seen the moment he says god cannot be seen now what is the principle behind it it means god cannot be heard god cannot be uh, you know you cannot smell god with your nose you cannot touch god you cannot taste god that is that is a symbolic representation seeing is a symbolic representation of all the five senses so it means god cannot be perceived with the senses this is a typical style of the shastras they always use one word to symbolize a whole concept a whole principle if you don't get to the principle now you will stick merely to the words if you get stuck with merely the words then you will miss the beauty and grandeur of the uh, total principle see supposing you are entering uh, a palace now let us say the entrance is very nice the entrance is so beautiful there are lovely pillars and there are some carvings there so the uh, it is meant for you to enjoy but after that you will have to enter the palace the entrance is there only for you to enter the main building the entrance alone is not the building it is a very small part of the building through which you can access the main building supposing you get stuck in the entrance itself entrance is so beautiful so you don't want to go inside the building inside the palace then you will miss the entire beauty of the palace it's the same thing 
the words the language part the words these are all just serve as entrances they all of them put together is an entrance to the main building they themselves are very attractive if you take the uh merely the language see any classical language will always have its beauty and sanskritam being a classical language will have its attraction naturally the grammar part the chanting part now all these things are at the periphery they all put together form the entrance like you have a pillar you have some carvings you have some uh let us say some steps like this different aspects so as you enjoy them you should not get stuck there now you should proceed further that is what we are doing with the yogic approach so even if you take the mahabharata the story is there the plot now if you get caught up with the the uh, story part or the characters part then again you will miss the main message so in the bhagavad gita lord krishna is there arjuna is there now they are meant to convey they are having a conversation but actually that is only the entrance through that when you enter the main building it's a it's a vast vast uh universe the timeless wisdom is being given you will miss all that if you get caught with the entrance the entrance is so beautiful there is a nice place for you to sit also in you know in most of the uh old type houses you will have a kind of a small place to sit at the entrance no so you like it so much that you are permanently sitting there you don't enter the main building why i'm telling you this is there is a mail which i have received last week now the person who has written this mail is a great sanskrit pandit it looks like he is following the sunday sessions now what he says what he has mentioned in that mail is that he has come across these words like shri bhagavan vacha lokes min vividhanishta so many times in his life he has read the bhagavad gita many times he has explained the meaning of these shlokas to many of his students as a part of the sanskrit uh, study he is a Sa- sanskrit scholar and teacher also so the word meaning of these uh, verses have been explained to many students he said he i mean he uh, he says many many times i have read this actually he knows the entire bhagavad gita by heart that is very interesting see any one of us if someone were to ask us to quote the whole bhagavad gita we will not be able to so that is a special talent you know of course uh, this uh, person he uh, being a sanskrit scholar and just by mere repetition going on teaching the word meaning of the same verse you know ch- uh, chanting the sanskrit shloka then uh, splitting it up into the different words and then explaining again chanting making the other students chant Uh, not only the gita many other scriptures also he in as a part of the uh, sanskrit teaching so just by repeating this again and again all the verses have 
uh, gotten into his memory, which is really wonderful. But he has asked a very interesting question. What he is asking is now. I have seen the Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Lokesmin Vividanishta so many times in my life. I have read that, I have chanted that, I have explained the word meaning and all that. But last week, when you gave the sequence where Sri Bhagavan Uvacha from the from the ultimate sense means the supreme. Infinite reality expressing itself as what? Loki, the entire universe, um, all the 14 dimensions. And then coming to Asmin, this world, this means your right now as an individual, I am here. So I am also a manifestation of the infinite. And then Dvividha Nishta. So how am I going to get back to the infinite? Nishta. What is the path which I am going to take? And then we are going to see that Pura Prokta. He says every phrase when you were explaining uh, to my utter surprise, it was as if I was reading it for the first time. Because Pura Prokta, when you say that, that is a reference, that's a reminder to the soul. You have gone through many births and this wisdom has been given to you and again an opportunity is being provided. The whole uh, color of the, uh, of the verse changed completely, he said. They, these same words which I have been repeating so many times now have started speaking to me a totally different language. This is the exact phrase which is used. They are, they are speaking a totally different language to me. Now, why is that? It's a very positive sign, you know, for a person who has mastered the language part. So to now get into the yogic approach is something which is commendable. I genuinely appreciate and congratulate uh, the Sanskrit Pandit. Because generally when you, uh, bec when you gain uh, a skill in something, it's very difficult to go beyond that, especially when it comes to the Sanskritam language. Uh, when you become a, when, when you attain a Panditvam in this, the mastery in this, it's so uh, wonderful, the language part, the flowery words and all that, that 99.9% .9 don't go beyond that to the, uh, to the deeper aspects. So here you have been able to do that means it is something phenomenal. Th that is the proof of Pura Prokta, you know, you have the seeds right from the past. So, there is an important point here. Why is it that in spite of seeing the same words and all that for so many years, why is it that uh, I have missed the sequence? This is the question which is asked. The answer to that is this only. The entrance, see this, all these form the entrance of the main building. Now, the entrance itself is so attractive that the majority of the people uh, get stuck there. The language part, the construction part, the, the intellection part, the logic. So all these things are so attractive that chances are 
you will get stuck there but when you get the opportunity to do the sadhana of the yogic approach that is when you leave the entrance and go forward when i say you leave the entrance is not that now you forget the lang- you'll forget the language or the words and all that it's not like that you will uh, you will you you will start exploring the vast vast wisdom which is there behind these words by getting attuned to the higher energy see unless and until the higher energy is tapped is invoked uh the yogic approach is not possible so in uh, one of the things what uh, he has mentioned is i am so amazed that something is right in front of me but i have missed it why is that i am so amazed by that there is nothing to get amazed about if at all you have to be amazed about it is the fact that uh, god is present everywhere see i am amazed about that god is present everywhere outside inside you yourself are a manifestation of god that supreme reality yet you have missed god you have missed the infinite even right now god is right in front of you but you don't recognize the presence of divinity as you are breathing the power behind the breath is nothing but that infinite power and how many times you are breathing continuously yet you are missing divinity so if you can miss god who is right in front of you then obviously you will miss the deeper messages what is a big deal so if you are amazed that yes uh, i have you know in spite of uh, reading this so many times how did i miss it i would say now step up your amazement don't be amazed about this be amazed about the fact that you are in touch with the divine principle every moment of your life as shankara says atma tu satatam prapta the atman the soul is an ever present reality and yet you miss it in the second chapter in one verse Krish, uh, you know krishna beautifully uh, conveys this by using the word ascharyavat he says when you get into that frequency you will stand in wonderment one talks about it with ascharya ascharyavat means with one with wonderment one hears about that with wonderment so it is nice that you feel amazed you feel that ascharya you are so surprised but now don't be surprised about these things direct that energy of ascharyavat to the higher start uh, uh, start getting into a state of wonderment with respect to life it is amazing the how you know one hand birth happens other hand death happens and so many experiences in between that the supreme reality is right there and yet you are missing it every second in the poem ancient mariner you know he says he goes in the ocean you no know, the sea the uh, uh, and he sees water everywhere so he sing, he writes there you know water water everywhere not a drop to drink 
water, water everywhere, all boats shrink, he says. Very powerful words. Divinity is there everywhere, but not a drop to drink. You are not drinking even a single drop. You are not experiencing that. So, for a yogi, that itself is amazing. The maya which deludes everyone is an amazing thing for a yogi. It is said in the Puranas that all the great rishis, you know, whenever they, they want some entertainment, like nowadays if you want some entertainment, what do you do? You switch on the TV or you switch on the, your cell phone and you watch a movie or you, you some, something you do. Now, are all those things uh, real? They are not real. You know very well that they are not real, but they entertain you. You see a particular serial where a person is going there to uh, kill and this person is protecting. So all this you know it's not real, but yet you watch it with a lot of interest. Now similarly, in the good old days, the yogis had a form of entertainment. That is, whenever they used to, uh, they, they wanted entertainment, they just used to close their eyes and start thinking about the maya of divinity, the maya, the maya shakti, the illusory power which is deluded the entire world. How the soul goes through the various ups and downs, the birth, death, various experiences. This, that. You know, it's millions and millions of experiences. But then the whole thing is an illusion. So they just used to think about that and they used to smile. Just as you are watching the cell phone, some uh, some series or whatever it is that you are watching and you are enjoying. So, it, the, in the good old days, the, the rishis and yogis used to entertain themselves every now and then by thinking about how the maya has enveloped the whole world, has deluded the mind, the minds of everyone. And once you get deluded, what is there right in front of you, you don't see it. Whatever is not real, you take it as real. So all attempts made to break this Maya and get back to that infinite is called Yoga. Is a, is a spiritual path. Your very purpose of life, see once you understand the sequence, the infinite has expressed itself as his entire universe, macrocosm, and then you are a part of the macrocosm. You are the individual. Now, the maya, the uh, the delusory power is there where you got disconnected. Now you have to make attempts to uh, get back, get back in the sense to reconnect with the infinite. That is the nishtha. So in this world, there is the twofold path as stated by me earlier. Pura, olden times. So, as I told you last week, that's a subtle reference to Nara Narayana. He's trying to trigger the tapas which Arjuna had done in the previous birth. See, supposing, let's say, you know to drive a car. And you've been driving the car for a few years, you learn the whole thing. 
and then after that you stop driving the car for a while let us say for a long period of time 30 40 years and you have stopped driving the car for such a long time that you have forgotten how to drive the car let's take that case it happens with many people you know sometimes you don't do something for a long period of time and then you you you're not confident about doing that as if the you're going to do it for the first time so then you go to the to a uh, to a car instructor and ask him, please teach me how to drive the car he says uh, you you know we'll get a temporary license to which you tell him i already have a license you show him acha you got license long back so you, have you driven a car it's so long ago i don't even remember anything now the moment you tell him you already driven a car and all that now he is not going to start from the basics this is what a car is these are the wheels car is meant to take you from this place to there is he going to give you all that lecture he will not do all that he will t- tell you now you just put the gear you remember this uh, and start the process start driving the steering control you may not have so much of control but he will just ask you to drive he will try to revive whatever previous knowledge or skill which you had acquired because that will make his work also easy and that is the right way because once that is revived then you can proceed from there at least to if that is triggered you know that will be your base it's the same thing which lord krishna is doing here arjuna had already done a lot of tapas now you may ask me sir arjuna was nara he did tapas now what tapas have i done of course you have done a lot of tapas problem is you have forgotten why maya you have gotten involved in so many other things that if for see if you have come down from that divine state that itself you have forgotten then where are you going to remember all the sadhana which you have done if you have not done sadhana in your previous births you will not be sitting here and getting this wisdom especially the yogic approach the subtler aspects uh is impossible you will not get an opportunity haven't you felt this many people have told me when they hear the sessions many a times they feel they have heard it before many people have said sir the day i say, i came for your, the your session i felt i have heard your voice also before i have heard this you know all these uh, points earlier but it is all in a state of confusion sometimes when uh, a wonderful point is given uh, you appreciate it so much because that triggers something within you the entire wisdom is there within you only it is all lying there you have come down from the divinity only from the infinite we are only triggering that we are only reviving whatever you already have restoring something restoring this infinite wealth to you which already belongs to you actually that's why restoring would be a better word nothing new is being given so that is why he says pura prokta triggering arjuna's deeper mind even though he is not doing it directly here in the fourth chapter he'll be doing it directly he will instigate arjuna and he will uh, uh, trigger more you know when we come there we'll see that but as of now you should also get into the spirit so don't consider yourself uh, as an ordinary person don't think oh i am i am not a sa- great sadhak long long way to go the more you think like that the the more uh, it will become a reality 
The fact that you are getting exposed to this means you you had a past. No need to develop an ego over it also now. Oh, I have done that. See, the problem is if I tell this, the mind immediately slips to that extreme ego. Now, in order to uh, lessen the ego, suppose I say, "What is there? What is a big deal? You are an insignificant uh, a speck of uh, it, like a speck of dust in this vast universe." get back the moment that is said then the mind goes to this extreme and loses all confidence so as a sadhak maintain your balance neither develop a superiority complex nor should you develop an inferiority complex that is what a true sadhak is now when he says pura olden times ancient there is another very deep significance which again will be expanded in the fourth chapter but i am mentioning the principle here itself that is lord krishna being an avatar purusha one who has descended from the infinite with full consciousness now he identifies with that infinite and he is making the statement so when you look at it from the point of view of the infinite it is the infinite alone which can teach god alone can teach no human can teach you know uh, i mentioned to you many a times no no human can give healing and all that we just invoke the higher shakti now what happens we can't predict or what will happen you know similarly no human being can teach can communicate this wisdom it is the infinite alone which can communicate this wisdom see supposing you you uh, uh read about god in a book can the book communicate what god is no that is why a person who merely has external knowledge cannot communicate this effectively he may have great communication skills all that will be useful to uh, uh, to communicate other worldly knowledges but when it comes to the spiritual wisdom to the extent you are connected to the infinite that to that extent alone you can communicate because its communication is in the form of energy not in the form of words words are too shallow the same thing a mere scholar may say and a saint may say there will be a big difference in terms of energy when the saint says that that will do something to you the same bhagavad gita may be uh, explained by a professor with all due respects to his uh, research the uh, efforts which he has put in his uh, research and all that but all that is external research it will have only a certain amount of power what he can communicate will be very less whereas when a yogi or a saint communicates now that transforms the other person why because he is connected to the infinite and that is the true source of communication the divine wisdom can be communicated only if a person is connected to the infinite so when he says i have um pura prokta mayana this has been told by me earlier me means not uh, you should not see it from a restricted point of view as lord krishna he means that infinite whom he is representing not krishna was an avatar you know the formless reality that infinite power so that infinite power has inspired many many masters in the past the infinite has spoken through many masters at any pa- at any period of time in any part of the world if when someone gets connected to the infinite then he uh, becomes a yogi he gets united 
and he starts communicating the truth in his own way. He may use uh, his local language, he may use, he may have his own style of presentation and all that. But what he will be communicating is the highest energy. So when Krishna talks, why is it that we still uh, feel the same vibrations? Because we can't even say Krishna is connected to the infinite. He is, he is a personification of the infinite. That's the meaning of avatar, you know. So naturally, it is not the personality Krishna who is communicating. It is the infinite expressing through him. All masters, when Buddha spoke, why was there so much of power? Because the infinite was speaking through him. When Christ spoke, why was there so much of power? Because the infinite spoke through him. Different masters at different periods of time, they got attuned to the infinite reality and thereafter the infinite started expressing itself through them. So, Pura Prokta, as stated by me earlier, is a very, is a universal message. Right from time immemorial, many, many masters have uh, come and the infinite has spoken through them. And that will continue to happen even today. And it will continue to happen in the future also. So, Pura Prokta, when he uses the word Pura, even though it is a reference to the past, it is also an indication uh, indicative reference to the present and the future. This is something which you can make a note of. Pura Prokta Maya. The, the, this has been uh, stated by me earlier. O Anagha. Anagha means sinless one, one who is innocent, no faults whatsoever, one who is pure, handsome. So Krishna has so much of affection for Arjuna. See, a master always has unconditional love to his student, not only to students, to everyone actually. But that unconditional love expresses itself when a student approaches the master. He has the highest respect and regard and love. Actually, it's very difficult to understand what unconditional love is. And if you cannot understand it, very difficult to feel it also fully. That's why Swami Vivekananda, when he went to America, you know, they were talking about love. One day in his lectures, he said, all of you are talking so much about love, but actually what you're talking about is just lust only. He said, no, none of you know what true love is. He said, I know only one person who knew how to love, and that was my master. He, is, he was referring to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. He said, my master alone knew how to love. Why did he make that statement? Because he, he was referring to the unconditional love which was showered upon him by uh, his master. So that is the kind of love and affection which Krishna has for Arjuna. And it is not only that, there is a significance there. Anagha means he is referring to each and every one of the world. Anyone who reads this is an anagha. How? You are essentially pure. Whatever faults or sins which you are having today are all acquired ones. They are not a part of your inherent nature. That is the 
message here you are essentially divine all your negativity is false everything has been acquired what has been acquired can be dropped what your essential nature is cannot be dropped and you are essentially divine why are you essentially divine because you have come down from the divinity that is why i said shri bhagavan uvacha lokes min that supreme reality has expressed itself as you so when krishna calls arjuna as anaga he is looking at the purity of the soul the inherent nature of the individual that is what a master always relates to the other faults and negativities and all that uh, no doubt the ma- master will help the student to overcome them but his identification is never with the, those factors when angulimala met buddha everyone saw angulimala as a highway robber if you ask me was he a highway robber yes he was doing that action but how did buddha see, uh, see him he saw him as an inherently pure soul who had got involved in the with these various negative activities because of maya and angulimala was able to feel that unconditional love from buddha that is why he got transformed when valmiki met narada it's the same thing which happened valmiki uh, initially he was a uh a robber but the unconditional love of sage narada hit him and his inherent pure soul started reacting to that he received a very powerful diksha initiation empowerment from uh, uh sage narada you know and he started doing his sadhana there are so many examples from the past to illustrate how these great masters have unconditional love for one and all and how people who were able to attune to that and receive that benefited from that because remember there is no power which is greater than unconditional love many people ask me sir can you teach healing i i say no because healing can always boost a person's ego also the moment you get a thought i am a healer and all that and all the spiritual tapas which you have gained will go away he, he uh, uh, healing is a very very sacred science and that the you know where you completely dedicate you completely dissolve yourself and invoke the higher shakti and then the shakti only does everything so unless you come to that level it's better not to get into all that so they ask uh, well, actually one uh, he uh, a uh, healer i'm putting it in uh, quotes you know he had come to me some time back he had learned different modalities of healing and all that he had gone to tibet and he had learned some uh, healing method and so he was asking me sir i want to learn the highest form of healing from you and he asked me sir what is the highest form of energy healing energy you know which we can get attuned to i told him unconditional love he didn't actually understand because his ego was so strong ego means he was not an arrogant person it's just that his focus was on i want to be a healer it was more about people's recognition you know getting a name and fame that i am a healer so he was not able to get the point which i was trying to tell him he is an unconditional love is it you you may tap this energy that energy and all that 
but ultimately there is no power which is greater than unconditional love and one who taps into that energy the supreme energy that is the supreme energy of the infinite for him or her all the dimensions get opened up so when krishna says oh anagha oh sinless one it's a great opportunity for us to get attuned to that unconditional love and affection of that supreme master see this has to be read with devotion with that bhavana with that feeling then when he says anaga that will trigger the love within you the emotion it will do something to you it will trigger your emotion see how will you how do you relate to your parents do you relate to your parents intellectually it is through feeling how do you relate to your little ones it is a bhavana it is identification similarly how can we relate to the master it is through bhavana it is through love only when a master has unconditional love and when the student also has a lot of love and devotion affection then that relationship is what is a pure one how do you relate to god how do you find god very simple it is only through devotion when you receive that unconditional love which is already there the divine grace is always there when you receive that fully and when you reciprocate you become a sita pragnya no need of all this studying this verse that verse and all that don't worry we'll be continuing i'll be continuing with the discussion i'm only saying this is the highest principle so the highest energy of unconditional love is being given by krishna here when he says pura prokta maya anagha o sinless one o inherently pure soul take it as a message for you personally you are that pure soul you are that divine soul you go to a master and say oh thank you sir for whatever you have done and the master how what does he feel he says oh thank you that you have come and taken this because you are also the form a form of the infinite that is how a true master feels the, true, the the real real emotion of a master is that only you may respect the master you may disrespect the master you may uh uh show positive emotion negative emotion, anything it does not matter but what he has to give is just pure pure love that is what is being demonstrated here o anagha it doesn't say o fool lo this or that and all that oh handsome one anaga also means handsome one he is giving that confidence to arjuna you know even in the upanishad one of the upanishads the master refers to the student as oh handsome youth gain this wisdom he says so pura prokta mayanagha so what is the nishtha before we get into the uh jnana yogena sankhyanam see he says yoga of knowledge jnana yoga for sankhyas and yoga of action for yogis before we get into that i'll just give you a few dimensions of nishtha so once you understand those few dimensions and then when we go to this you will be able to effectively practice
So nishtha, we have translated it as path. But uh, see, that is a meaning which we have given in this context. But the literal meaning of nishtha may not be path. But it gives the meaning in this context when we say in this world there is a twofold path. So when we say path, you always think it is moving from uh, one place to another place. It is a way by which you shift yourself from one place to another place. But what is interesting is, Nishtha means position or condition, internal condition. So it is not like an external path. You don't need to go anywhere in order to find God. Wherever you are, that itself is fine. You just have to change your internal condition. That is Nishta. See, unless you understand that, when we come to yoga of knowledge for Sankhyas and yoga of action for yogis, you will not be able to get the deeper meaning of that. You will think, uh, yoga of knowledge is uh, one way, one path and uh, yoga of action, karma yoga is another path and all that. That's how people have taken it. There are people who have interpreted this as jnana yoga means it's a lifestyle where you wear ochre robes and all that and you and, and uh, yoga of action, kar, karma yoga means householder lifestyle. See, what, each one interprets it according to his or her own conditioning. In the yogic approach, we remove all the conditioning and see the reality, see the truths in all the dimensions. See, only when you view something from all the dimensions, you can get a full picture. If you want to know how a person looks, the front view will be one thing and the side view will be one thing. The back view will be one thing and the other side view and different angles you see, then only you can fully describe that person. You know, in novels and all, when they describe uh, characters, they describe the character from all angles. Very interesting. Then only you can get a full picture. It's the same thing with respect to these uh, verses. If you look at it from, a na from the narrow prism, of your mind, of your conditioning, then you will interpret it exactly how your mind is thinking. Then you will only get a limited knowledge. So here is a great opportunity to expand your vision, to get the full wisdom in all its dimensions. So, I, I will mention many, I will explain to you a few dimensions of Nishta as we go along. But the first thing which is important before you go to the next line is that Nishta means position or condition. So you don't need to shift your place. You don't need to change your dress to become spiritual. These are all externalities. People think spirituality means now I should wear a particular type of dress. People think I will have to now change my lifestyle completely. It is not all that. See, God is equally present everywhere in all lifestyle, in all dresses, in everything. So you un see if there is an internal urge, if you if you naturally like something and because of that if you change that is okay, but when you make an artificial change, because you think that if I do that now I'll become holy. Now you'll never become holy. So condition changing the internal condition, the condition of your mind. 
That is what is nishta. Position means, see right now, what is your position? You are, you are thinking you are a finite person. You are thinking, I am this individual. That is the position which you have fixed for yourself. Now you will have to change that position from being a finite person to that infinite reality. And that position can be changed only if you bring about a change in the internal condition. So even though we are using the word path, meaning uh, even last week I was saying twofold path, path, path. It is not an external, it is not like how you travel externally. There is nowhere to go. You are where you are. You live your uh, uh, whatever uh, life which you are uh, living. But you bring about a change in your internal condition due to which your position changes. Internally. Externally things may change, may not change. That depends upon the uh, context only, the necessity. That is why later on he will be saying that how sh uh, will a man of wisdom act? He says a person who has true wisdom will act exactly like an ignorant person, he says. But one big difference, the ignorant person acts with attachment. A person with true wisdom acts with detachment. That is the internal condition, the position has changed. See, right now your center is the body, is the, is the finite equipments. For a master, he has shifted his center of consciousness from the finite equipments to the infinite reality. He has only changed his position. There is a beautiful Zen story where uh, a person went to meet a Zen master, an enlightened master. And uh, at that time, he was... Uh, uh, you know, there was a well in the back, in the backyard there was a well and he was drawing water from the well and pouring it in a vessel there. So the student went to the master and he said, Sir, I have come all the way to see you. He said, Yes, what do you want? I want to know what were you doing before enlightenment, before you got enlightened, what were you doing? He said, I was drawing water from the well and pouring it into the vessel. So the student said, okay, now that you have got enlightened, what are you doing? He said, now that I have got enlightened, what I am doing is, I am drawing water from the well and I am pouring it in the vessel. The story ends there. I've told you, you know, Zen stories are always, always very, very short and crisp, but uh, impregnated with uh, very deep uh, principles. So we generally have an idea that enlightenment mean, enlightenment means something, uh, uh, you know, like they show in movies and all. No, suddenly one halo they'll show behind and. Uh, with all the, uh, you know, when a person is meditating, they will show the entire, the uh, rains coming and thunder, lightning and, and suddenly a glow will come in the face. See, you should understand that is a movie. They will have some red light and they would have put it on the face of that actor who is acting. So we always have this is a maya. The mind has a value for all these things. 
it values all the externalities of spirituality the kind of dress a person wear see how do you determine whether a person is spiritual or not you will first see what is the dress which he is wearing you will see uh, uh, whether uh, he is he has a lot of scriptural knowledge or not you have your own yardsticks but all that is not uh, a guarantee that a person is spiritual has he traveled in this path again i'm using the word path nishtha nishtha means condition internal condition what is his internal condition has he changed the position from finite to infinite that is the question so he just says dvividha nishta dvividha is what he is explaining in the next line the jnana yogena sankhyanam and karma how it is it has two aspects or two parts to it it's very very uh, practical i'll just give you a gist today and then we'll go into more depth but before giving you the gist at least this one dimension of nishta you should first understand that whatever path whatever uh, nishta we are talking about is not a, a change of place externally or change of lifestyle and all that it is changing your internal condition the other dimensions i will give you next week but with this dimension we'll go to the next line and i'll just give you a gist of it the jnana yogena sankhyanam karma yogena yogina which means he is dividing the entire humanity into two sankhyas and yogis either there are two types of people either people are of sankhya type or of yogi type and if you are a sankhya type no do uh, jnana yoga if you are a yogi type do karma yoga so what is this sankhya sankhya and yogi is referring to see they are actually not two independent natures both the sankhya aspect and the yogi aspect are within you only sankhya is the contemplative aspect within you the deeper aspect within you which can absorb the higher principles which can reflect which can think and when he is talking about yogi in this context he is talking about the practical application that aspect within you which can practically apply these principles in your life so one way to look at it is in this world there are two kinds of people externally um contemplative people and active people we can look at it like that but that is a very shallow interpretation that's why i covered low case min in detail because he is not actually talking about the external world here he is talking about the internal world as the great siddha said andathil ullade pindathil pindathil ullade andathil whatever is there outside is there within you and a yogi is focused on the internal world the 14 dimensions of existence which we are talking about everything is there within you only there are different energy centers and centers corresponding to each loka when that energy center is tapped you get access to that dimensional existence so both uh, the sankhya aspect that is a contemplative aspect right now we will take sankhya as a contemplative aspect you know that our aspect which absorbs the higher wisdom uh in a deep way and yogi means the the that aspect within you after absorbing which can practice which can execute it in life 
we we will take it that way so in this internal loka in this internal world now that is what is happening within you there are two people he says there are two aspects one is sankhya and the other is you um, yoga you are a sankhya at some time you are a, um, uh, a sankhya sometimes and you become a yogi sometimes either you are in an obs- uh, in a mood to absorb the higher principles sometimes or you are in a mood to convert it into kinetic energy that is act in the world both these aspects are within you only loke aspin loke smin in this world in this internal world that is why i gave you that uh, dimension of nishta nishta means position or condition internal condition so these are not two different parts which need to be followed one person has to follow jnana yoga one person karma yoga no whenever you are in an absorb uh, absorbing uh, mode you need to practice jnana yoga right now you take it as yoga of knowledge means the higher principles have to be absorbed you need to focus on that and whenever you have absorbed now there will be a lot of build up uh, of energy now that energy has to be applied uh, for constructive purposes outside for your development that time you should do karma yoga karma yoga means practical application of the higher principles so when uh, how do you get back to the infinite what is this nishtha how do you change your internal condition you have to practice these two things on one hand you should go on absorbing the higher principles on the other hand you should practicalize them in your life jnana yogena sankhyanam karma yogena yoginam see the the amazing uh, uh, principle which he is giving through through it looks like an innocuous statement doesn't it uh, sankhya is a practice jnana see <laughs> one person actually asked me the He said, "Sir, he says Jnana Yoga for Sankhyas, Karma Yoga for Yogi. Now I am neither a Sankhya nor a Yogi. Now what am I to follow? It's a valid question. So he is not talking about Sankhyas means some special people who are all sitting and uh, doing. It's not like that. All these are aspects within you." every aspect is personified into a form that is the yogic approach so see another person has asked if he is mentioning about jnana yoga and karma yoga he has not mentioned about bhakti yoga why we will come to that because incidentally nishtha itself means bhakti That, that part also I'll cover in the coming weeks. Uh, the one of the dimensions of nishta. Nishta means faith. It means devotion. He says that is the base. But that apart, when he is talking of jnana yoga and karma yoga here, he is not talking jnana yoga. He is not talking in terms of jnana yoga versus bhakti yoga versus other paths and all that. In, it is not in that context. Here. jnana yoga means the uh, the way of absorbing the the higher principles internally absorptive capacity which is incidentally there when you are studying the scriptures what people call as jnana yoga or which is there when you are acting in the world what people call as karma yoga or in bhakti yoga also so even in bhakti yoga these two aspects will be there you just close your eyes get connected to the divine and that you know your hair stand on their ends uh, uh, 
the the emotion you know you absorb the higher uh, devotion and then karma yoga is also there where you translate that that supreme uh, energy of devotion into love for your fellow beings that is practice of bhakti yoga in the world so instead of the word jnana yoga and karma yoga for easier understanding you can just substitute as absorption of the higher principles and application of those principles in life if you first substitute these words and understand this concept then it becomes very simple so when you are actually practicing jnana yoga not this jnana yoga i mean let us say you are studying the scriptures and all that you absorb the higher principles then you close the book you go and practice let us say you are uh, doing the karma yoga not in this sense but how people usually uh, use the word karma yoga you are an action you uh, reflect and understand uh, where you are going you give the purpose to your actions and then you execute your plans you plan and then act see there are always these two aspects in every area of your life there is always that higher planning the you can call it planning or higher absorption the higher aspect and then there is the execution aspect which is the practical application unless a person combines these two he cannot grow in nishtha he cannot move forward in the path so jnana yogena sankhyanam yoga of knowledge for sankhyas and karma yogena yoginam the yoga of action for the yogis so i want you to reflect on uh, this point uh, and then come back next week i'll give you more secrets more secrets will be revealed because actually this uh, uh, the word nishtha and then the dvivida which is explaining in the next line uh, it's so deep uh, if you if you get a hang of what he is saying your your capacity as as a sadhak will grow immensely see if you want to become a yogi you have to become a powerful sadhak the if you want if you get the a hang of what is conveying in this verse you will become a very very powerful sadhak and once you become a powerful sadhak the more powerful you are as a sadhak now you you, you don't need to go in search of uh, spiritual growth the spiritual growth will automatically happen to you you don't need to go in search of god god will come in search of you see the problem is when you don't gather that power of sadhana within you if you are not a powerful sadhak and then you are saying i want god i want spiritual development that can never work so this particular verse helps you to become a very powerful sadhak when we go to the other verses it is going to be an expansion of this verse only he will go on expanding uh, the different aspects of uh, the sadhana the practical application which he calls as karma yoga and when we talk of practical application obviously we will be covering the principles also so every verse if you observe we are even though you didn't know these terms before if you had, if you carefully think about it if you observe we have been following the same thing only in the yogic approach a high principle is given for you to absorb and then the sadhana tips the practical tips are also given the sadhana message 
you this is a homework for this week i say i don't know whether you're doing that home with all those homeworks or not because we don't have a system where we correct and say put a mark and all that it's not i in spirituality we cannot do something like that but with my duty to give i'm giving thereafter whether you want to practice it or whether you're going to become a powerful sadhak or not all that depends on you only so we are following the same thing the high principles are given and then the practical application is given the sadhana part so when you combine these two your progress in spirituality uh, is assured the nishtha the you 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 start progressing in your nishtha your internal condition starts changing will start changing is this clear so we will stop with that for today uh, i have given a, a lot of uh, points both the higher principles and the practical application so just reflect on them and uh, absorb them and then try to practice see as of this week you you just uh, you know convert everything into these two things principles practice Uh, your in your whole life itself can be divided into two aspects in every area there is there is always a principle which i need to absorb or understand which i need to master and then i'll have to uh, apply that principle practically in my life that's how uh, you can grow in any field supposing you want to learn how to play the flute there is a principle and then there is a practice part sir i want to become a computer engineer there are principles and then there is a practical application sir i want to improve my relationship with my family there are certain principles governing relationships and there is a practical application of that if you effectively combine these two you will be successful in any area you want so just think about that and try to uh see it in your life uh, next week we'll go into um more detail i'll give you more dimensions of nishtha which will help you to uh practice the second line better in life and increase the power of your sadhana that is going to be our aim from here onwards you are already a sadhak now how to go on increasing your power as a sadhak your your goal should not be i want to become a master then you will never become your goal should be how to become a more powerful student how to become a more powerful sadhak we we'll use the word sadhak it's more uh, relevant okay so we'll see all that in the coming weeks now we'll do the meditation gently close your eyes do deep breathing feel the divine vibrations
with every breath i am going deeper and deeper into myself beyond the physical body beyond the mind beyond the intellect lies the supreme self I am one with that infinite reality I am inherently divine I am inherently pure I am Swayam Prakashit self illuminating
offer your gratitude to God supreme offer your gratitude to your guru and all the holy masters slowly come back Wiggle your fingers, your toes. Rub your palms together to create a warmth. Cup your eyes with your palms. Gently rub your eyes, your cheeks, forehead, top of the head, back of the head and neck. Slowly open your eyes. Welcome back. So anagha means pure one. That is what you are. You may make a list of all your faults and impurities and you may email it to me but that will never convince me that you are impure because you are essentially divine you are essentially pure whatever faults which you are telling me about yourself they are all acquired ones through sadhana you can drop them as you ad- advance in uh, spirituality 
you will start feeling this that i am essentially divine i am pure it's only f- a person who does sadhana properly and removes whatever uh, dirt and faults which he has acquired who will be able to uh, feel the power of anagha in the 22 day program anandoham we are going to see many many dimensions of ananda not one aspect of happiness many many means we are talking of uh, about uh, 15 or more aspects different dimensions of ananda these are all preparations for you to receive that energy the different empowerments are going to be given so that preparatory meditation which has been sent to you now kindly do that in the evening whenever you're finding time that will ensure that when you go to sleep you will have a very peaceful sleep don't live a, don't leave a very long gap between that meditation and sleep a few hours here and uh, is okay and the whole night that energy will be working within your system because the 22 day anandoham is very powerful each dimension of ananda like we saying anaga you no know, purity that is a simple word dimension but when we uh, unearth more and more dimensions from within of the infinite happiness that is a very powerful experience so you need to prepare yourself for that okay so i'll see you next week reflect on all these points and uh, come back fresh we'll go into more depth of this verse it's going to make you a very powerful sadhak not only this verse and then next verse next verse each verse will be adding more power to your sadhana by the time we go uh, you know into this chapter more and more if you f- very carefully follow the flow of energy there will be a very big transformation from within okay so thank you very much hari om